The night has been short and it's raining, but nobody's complaining because they've waited for this moment for a very long time. We're in South Africa, which has one of the highest levels of hunting in the world. I'm with a group of French people. They're here for an eight-day safari. This is 57-year-old Alain's last chance to practice. Hunting lions in South Africa is perfectly legal. At the start of the expedition, we cross some cattle grids. Hunting doesn't take place in the wilderness here, but in vast private domains, which are entirely fenced off. There's little chance of the animals escaping. The hunters quickly track down a lion. Alain is accompanied by three armed hunting guides and one tracker. It's dangerous, but the adrenaline and the thrill is what draws these hunters. After 30 minutes of tracking, the big cat is in their sights. He's about 80 meters away, hidden in the brush at the edge of this track. A single bullet was sufficient. The lion died from one single bullet wound straight into the middle of his chest. The hunt lasted less than an hour. Congrats. Very good. Alors, qu'est-ce que tu as fait? Je sais pas, je peux pas l'expliquer, c'est c'est comme ça, mais c'est un très très bel animal. C'est j'en ferai qu'un, ça c'est sûr. Je suis content qu'il soit beau, mais c'est un... après bon, il y a il y a l'émotion euh... tout mélangé, du regret, de la joie, tout. C'est bien. C'est une belle chasse. Beautiful. It's time for the photo. The guides and trackers prepare the animal. The blood is wiped off, and the lion arranged to show off the hunter's prowess. Alan paid 15,000 euros for this lion. Each animal has a price. These guys have also hunted a hyena for 3,000 euros, an impala for 500 euros, a leopard for 12,000 euros, and two buffalo at 8,000 euros each. In total, their safari has cost them 70,000 euros, a lot of money. But in other African countries, it would have cost them up to five times as much. In South Africa, hunting is an industry. Everything is perfectly organized. It's all set up so that the client is satisfied and can go home with their trophy. This hunting business is worth more than 100 million euros. It's a profitable activity, but one that is increasingly subject to criticism. A business where the animal is nothing more than an object. We are investigating the privatization of the wilderness. In South Africa, we start our journey at Bella Bella in the north.
When we think of Africa, we imagine wild animals roaming freely in the savannah. But the reality is that behind this idyllic image, man is everywhere here. He controls, organizes, and sells the animals. Today in Bella Bella, they're auctioning off zebras, antelopes, and rhinoceroses as if they were furniture. There are only white people in the room, and they're all here looking for a good deal. They're here to buy animals for nature reserves and photo safaris, but also for hunting. Bidding begins. Christophe Mays knows the figures. This former accountant left France six years ago to become a hunting guide in South Africa. He takes me to the warehouse where the 300 animals on sale that day are being held. Behind these doors are true treasures. The stud animals, the most handsome specimens of each species. Christophe Mays carefully checks the head and the horns of the animal, which will end up as a trophy for the hunter. What makes the value of an animal in this kind of vent aux enchères? Son âge et la qualité de son trophée. Il faut qu'il soit sain de corps, qu'il n'y ait pas de parasites, que son pelage soit brillant et vif et qu'il ait un très très grand cornage. Ça, c'est le fameux gnou doré. C'est un animal très très cher. Il a un tout petit cornage. Vous voyez maintenant la, la qualité de, du trophée par rapport à ses oreilles C'est un mâle adulte. Ça, ça va partir entre 20 et 25 000 euros. C'est des sommes astronomiques. C'est des sommes astronomiques. Contrary to what one might think, these animals were not captured in the wild. They all belonged to farmers. They were born into captivity, raised by the farmers, and then selected for auction. Et donc là, qu'est-ce qui va se passer si quelqu'un achète cet animal Il va être mis dans un enclos de reproduction avec toutes ses femelles et en espérant qu'il fasse le maximum de petits bébés, porteurs de trophées équivalents de ce qu'il a sur sa tête. Et donc c'est en fait après qu'on ira chasser nous les, la descendance de ces animaux-là. They choose the best looking animals to be sent out to be hunted. It is the livestock that is at the heart of this ultra efficient business model and investors speculate on their value as if they were stocks and shares. It's enough to give you vertigo. Ici, c'est plutôt une chasse business plutôt qu'une chasse passion. C'est un business qui rapporte beaucoup d'argent ici. Un business qui fait vivre énormément de gens. C'est un gros business. Beaucoup de fermiers laissent tomber l'élevage de vaches pour se mettre à l'élevage de gibier parce que c'est c'est porteur. C'est très c'est c'est mieux que la bourse. As a result, in South Africa, more than 10,000 farmers breed animals for hunting. We have arranged a meeting with one of these millionaire farmers who are notoriously difficult to speak to. This farm is one of the biggest in the country. From the entrance to the house, it's a 20-minute drive. Caroline and Jacques were nursery owners, and then 20 years ago they bought this property and started breeding animals. Thank you. If you look down here, the majority close to us is our property. You look down here behind those tall trees, about two miles down there, you'll find the car road, and it goes to those open grass areas. That's more or less the end of the farm. It's about 7,000 hectares, and it's all well-developed for game farming. Let's go and have a look. 7,000 hectares, 
It's almost as big as Paris. The simplest way to take a tour of the grounds here is in a helicopter. Thousands of animals live on this land. They're free to move around within the fences. In South Africa, 70% of wild animals, in fact, live on private land. To get the best produce, Jacques selects the genetic pedigree of the animals. Jacques' prized possessions are his buffaloes. If you call them, they stop, and then you can see them. Last year, one of them sold for two million euros at an auction. With their giant horns and perfect proportions, animals like these can no longer be found in the wild. Because of the hunting pressure of all the years in Africa, that all the big males have been shot out. What we do is we source good mothers with good horns, good fathers. We try to bring them together to try and breed back all those top trophies, all those top genetics, so that we don't sit with an inferior buffalo. Jack is a savvy businessman. He knows he has to keep the clients interested, and so he's always offering new things, notably rare or new colors. That's the most unique. Golden noose, completely white antelopes, and even black giraffes. Originality pays off, and these unusual animals can be worth up to 1,000 times more. Ordinary impala is worth about uh, 5,000 rand, and those black ones with the saddleback are now worth between three and six million rand. And why the difference is so huge? Because it is unique and it is rare, and it's not uh, commonly available. Mixing all the species and creating like this colors uh, can let think that you, you are playing God a little bit? Well, I, I don't think so. I, I think that uh, what we do is what we've been taught out of nature. And in nature, we've seen that the specific color runs with a so-called ordinary color. It is not colors which are being generated by men. It is natural colors which are found in nature and then multiplied. What would be the interest for hunters to hunt the, the species? A lot of hunters are collectors. They've hunted everything. Now they want to hunt something new, something exciting. It's the same trend as with flowers, where you've got a new flower. Uh, all the ladies just love it because it's new. And it's like a dress. No woman likes to wear the same dress for three years in a row. Uh, they like to change. Up to 10,000 foreigners go to South Africa every year to go hunting, mostly Russians and Americans. The ensuing race for trophies has caused an explosion in one industry, that is taxidermists. There are hundreds across the country, and one has agreed to open its doors for us. Mijak is busy cutting an African elephant. You can see that's the oh, trunk. that's the trunk, yeah. There's the face with an eye, that side, very small eyes. Oh. What are you going to do with the skin of the face of the elephant? Um, this is going to be shoulder mount. We'll go to the mold, and I'll show you. It's going to get pulled over the mold, and this guy's going to hang it on his wall. The, the head of the elephant? Yes. But it's huge. Yes, it is big. These guys have massive houses and they build their own like showrooms. And this is actually a Russian client and he built a new house for all these trophies. Only for the trophies? Yes. 6,000 trophies are produced here every year. The taxidermists recover the skin, wash it, tan it, and dry it. That's what all what we mean from the giraffe. Where's the head? You just touched it. They take off the horns and the claws and then reconstruct the animal with a plastic mold, which will make the base for the trophy. It's all a bit hard to believe. They're busy fitting the hippo skin on the mold to see if it will fit. Otherwise, they'll make this 
mold either bigger or smaller. So they're just going to pull the skin over and move it into the right positions. It takes an average of eight months to make a trophy, and they don't come cheap. 4,000 euros for a lion, and up to 70,000 euros for an elephant. The client says what he wants, and we try to make it as close to that, his vision of that animal as he Even he if can. it's not, nothing to do with reality of a nature or? That's normally the Americans. Yeah? They want big muscles and they, they want like bodybuilder animals, like kudus with thick necks and... Um, because they look stronger. Yeah, they look stronger and more impressive. It's all about the size. The bigger the horns, the bigger the animal, the more it weighs. It's all about the size. Cool. To highlight the strength and courage of the hunter, they also produce other products with the animal remains, from lamps to chandeliers and stools. When it comes to interior design, it seems the hunters have plenty of imagination. I had a client that wanted the elephant's penis mounted. It was like mounted on a piece of wood and it was hanging on the wall. The balls and the penis. Of an that, elephant? Yeah, of an elephant. It's just weird. <laughs> who are these trophy hunters who collect animals like stamps? In South Africa, 90% of foreign hunters are American. Welcome to Texas, cowboy country. Texas is the US state known for cowboy boots and rodeos. It's also the state with the most guns in the USA. 30 million weapons for 27 million inhabitants and one and a half million hunters. Here, you don't joke about hunting. Welcome. How are you doing? Sorry, it's raining. <laughs> For Cole Reed, a trophy collector, it's his passion and a big part of his family's history. But this is the, uh, the Grand Lodge, the uh, trophy room, as it were. It's, it's really impressive. It's, it's pretty impressive. How many, how many trophies do you have here? Uh, there's about 200 in here total. Cole Reed's family has made a fortune in real estate. They use it to fund their international hunting trips. From wolves to zebras, baboons and bears, they have hunted everything. This up here is actually probably the most impressive part of the game room. It's what people really look at the most. Uh, up on this shelf is the African Big Five. And what that is is the lion, the leopard, the cape buffalo, the rhino and the elephant. Here, they love to collect trophies. This lion, for example, is incredibly important to them. And when that lion was shot, and it was actually shot with a bow in uh, Tanzania, and when it was shot, it was the number one world record, the biggest lion ever killed. What's the interest to have all these trophies? Because some people may find that a little bit, like, mobile or, like, right. kind of... I think people, you know, since the caveman days were, you know, look at the mastodon I killed, look at the mastodon I killed, you know, mine's bigger. You know, we've always had this competition and it's a friendly competition, you know. It's, it's also giving us a memory of that hunt and that adventure that we had. A lot of Americans book their safaris here in Dallas at one of the biggest hunting fairs in the world. It attracts 40,000 visitors from across the country. Thank you for spending your day with us. I know you could be out playing golf, or doing dishes, or something like that. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's a vast supermarket for hunters. You can find camouflage gear, watchtowers, trophies, all-inclusive safaris, which can cost up to 300,000 euros. You can hunt just about anything you want, anywhere in the world, including species that you might think would be protected, such as polar bears in Canada. The star product at this year's fair is the South African lion. You can even choose which one from a catalogue. Why is it less expensive than this one? 
Well, as you can see, this one's a little bit more mature in a sense. This has actually got a more of a thicker mane. And also some of these, let me have a look. It also depends the kind of photo, because people want different kinds of photos and they want to mount different kinds of, you know, it really just depends. The look and the size and the type, because there are different types. It's funny because it looks like a catalog, like, like if you are buying some clothes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And to kill your lion, there are guns, hundreds of guns. They come in all different shapes, sizes and colours, so you can kill in style and from any age. This is, this is the one. What kind of animal do you want to hunt in Africa? Uh, like, a lion? What do you want to hunt a lion? Because just, I've always wanted to shoot all the, uh, like, the animals in Africa. Here, they're very uninhibited when it comes to hunting. However, some recent scandals are now tarnishing this world. It started with Juan Carlos in 2012. The King of Spain paid 30,000 euros to kill an elephant in Botswana. The Spanish, who were experiencing a financial crisis, were shocked. His popularity tanked. Two years later, he abdicated. In the photo to the left is his hunting guide, Jeff Renand. I'm in luck. Jeff is here at the fair. For the first time, he agrees to talk about what happened on camera. I don't really like to discuss it, and I've, um, you know, we, we were just, uh, had a relationship as a client and a friend and a hunter. Um, the politics of it, uh, I really don't understand. What he did was, was uh, I think it, it was totally legal. Um, it was a great hunt. Um, he, he's, a, as I say, a great conservationist. And he, the, the, the value and the money that was, came in from those safaris helped manage the, the Botswana wildlife population. But yeah, but he had to apologize for what mm. he done. I, I think again, that's politics, and and uh, you know I try not to get involved in politics or the emotions of of, of hunting. In 2013, there was a new scandal. Two Americans published photos of their kills. You can see them smiling, victorious, with the animals they hunted at their feet. This sparked petitions, insults, and death threats. Whilst in South Africa, they took part in what is called a canned hunt, a controversial form of hunting in which semi-domesticated lions are shot down one by one. It's a nasty little secret that South Africa has managed to hide for many years. So I'm going back to investigate. Here, the king of the jungle is condemned to spend his whole life caged up. In order to satisfy lion hunters' demands, lions are bred like chickens, often in deplorable conditions, which aren't always legal. To prove it, we had to be cunning. We posed as hunters. It was the only way to gain access to one of the 200 lion farms in the country. We filmed with a secret camera. At the entrance, there are two domesticated lion cubs, scarcely weaned, in a 15 square meter enclosure. One month. One month. That one is four months. Oh. They are very cute. Yeah, they are very cute. Yeah. The owners offer us the chance to see the farm. <coughs> the lion cubs seem inquisitive and happy to see us. They don't seem at all wild. According to the law, the animals must have one hectare of living space each, which is far from being the case here. They're crammed in like in kennels. Uh, we, we bring all these, we bring them here. We sell them at about two, two and a half years old to other game farms. And uh, obviously the better ones will be hunted. Supposedly, the breeder does not have the right to organize hunts here. If 
you want to hunt a lion. Yeah. yeah. What we do is if we, if we if you pick a lion, yeah. then we, we take it to another farm. Okay. Where it has to be released for a week or so in advance. Yeah. And, and then you hunt from there on, on foot. You cannot hunt here. I tell him my husband is South African. He feels safe to agree to bend the law. He's not a South African. Yes, he is. He is? Yes. Well, there is no problem. OK, so he can hunt in the same yes. place. OK. A little further along, one enclosure attracts my attention. Oh, the tiger. There's a tiger in among the lions. It's forbidden worldwide to hunt this protected animal. But the owner doesn't slow down. Clearly, this farm does not respect the law, and the owner isn't so shy when it comes to negotiating the price of the hunt. If you want to do it totally legal, then the, the, the price of the line will be about 50% more. So, you, okay. so we should do it in not in a legal way? I mean, uh, uh, if, uh, uh, if possible, not. The tiger, we cannot do a tiger. Uh, that's very, very illegal. On the other hand, if, if, if you uh, don't want to take it out, I mean, there's always there's ways and means to do it, but uh, we don't really like it. And this farm isn't an isolated case. A South African NGO has been investigating about 20 farms. These are the clips they filmed. We can see animals cooped up in tiny enclosures without shade. The lions are dirty and lifeless, and some of them are deformed due to inbreeding. I decided to ask for an explanation from the spokesman for lion breeders. Pieter Pochetta's mission is to defend an industry which faces mounting criticism. I showed him the clips the NGO have entrusted to me. Is it acceptable to see so many animals in a small enclosure? In my view, not. That it looks like mutants. It looks like animals with a lot of problem because of the inbreeding. Are you aware about the inbreeding problem? I am. It is a real problem. There are places in South Africa where Lions are kept in very bad conditions. There are many people who are not members of my association, who are not under the discipline of my uh, ethical code, which do as they like to. But what about the members of your association? Are you sure that they are all doing it well? I think so, yes. Look. We show him the images we took on our secret camera. At the farm where the lions are crammed in and where we were often in a legal hunt, that particular owner is a member of his association. If you want to do it totally legal, then the, the, the price of the lion will be about 50% more. He's a member of your association. He had a lot of bad publicity. Do you think it's normal that this guy is still working? Well, I have no way to, to know that he, he does illegal things, unless people tell me that. In the line industry is not corrupt, but all the crooks are in the line business. And it is my function and my mission to clear up this industry. So there really is a problem, but Peter Pocheta is sure he can solve it. Well, perhaps not straight away, though, as his association only has one paid employee himself. How many breeding farms did you visit? Not more than five. On 200? How can you be the person to tell me how is the industry now and how it is inside if you visit only five of these lion breeding farms? I don't... I don't... Uh, 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 regard it as my, as, my, as my function. Do you know how I would be, be travelling? I know, I've done it. <laughs> yeah. And I have much more to, to do than, than to visit lion farms and, and see what, what they are doing. And when I know I come, they, 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 they clean it up. How can you defend this guy? How can you try to influence the law for them? 
if you know all these things? Uh, Olivia, you, you, are, you are overstepping now your, your, your mission as a journalist. You're arguing with, with me about what I should be doing. You are, you are now talking like an like, uh, uh, NGO greenie, and I, I don't like it. We leave each other a little angrily. But if the farming of lions is a sensitive subject in South Africa, the way that they are killed is even more of a taboo. These practices are today denounced by certain hunters. This man, who has been organizing lion hunts for 15 years, has agreed to break his silence on the condition that he remain anonymous. What about these lions? I mean, how, um, in which condition are they released? Depending on the lion farmer itself, um, it can be tranquilized and put into the bush. It's supposed to be a 30 day, 60 day, depending on the area and the province, and sometimes it's the day before. Sometimes you've got a client that decides the night before he wants to hunt a lion, and the next morning you can, it gets done. Is it very often that the animal is still tranquilized during the hunt? I'm sure. I'm sure there's a lot of guys that do it like that. Uh, shoot the lion, get it over and done with. Most of the time, the guys would tell you that um, it's midday, the lion will go and sleep under a tree. And... Do you tell the truth to the clients or do you tell them the nice story about the, this lion? Well, that's why you try and make it as memorable as possible. You give him a good time, you make sure it's, he works for it. You try and give him a good hunt. Is it happened already that you didn't feel comfortable by shooting a lion? It happens. It happens. But somewhere you know that this isn't what you what you booked for. But the client is happy. And that's a principle. Yeah. In the industry, yeah. The hidden face of these lion hunts is quite disturbing. And many are contributing to this industry without even knowing. Welcome to Lion Park, an amusement park rated among the 100 best tourist destinations in the world. 300,000 visitors come here every year from all over the world to this enormous zoo which is totally dedicated to felines. This is where thousands of tourists' dreams come true. You can approach the big cats and pet the lion cubs. For 20 euros, you can treat yourself to a thrill from the other side of the fence. And of course, spend a little bit more money on souvenirs of this memorable experience. The attraction park states that it supports the protection of the big cats, as it says in this brochure given to the tourists. The Lion Park has gone to great lengths to ensure that our lions never end up in canned hunting scenarios or unsuitable environments. But some people question these claims. This morning, outside Lion Park, there is a demonstration organized by several NGOs. They accuse Lion Park of selling lions to hunters when they get too old to be petted by tourists. Opposite the animal welfare activists, a counter-demonstration has been organized by Lion Park. The staff deny the accusations levied against them. These allegations are harming the business, so the management of Lion Park wanted to show us what happened to the lions when they are no longer in contact with tourists. 25 kilometers from the park, we find the lion's retirement home. So now these guys are too old to be pets, right? That's right, yes. So they're now over six months when we don't allow cup petting. They'll never be wild lions, but we try to, to give them the kind of environment and the kind of facility where they can live happy lives with their families. Unfortunately, it might be that some of the other parks support the canned hunting industry. 
um, but it's, I can't speak on behalf of them. We can only speak from Lion Park and we don't support it. A paradise safe from hunters, which can accommodate up to 200 animals. But a lion in captivity can live for up to 20 years. So what happens when it reaches full capacity? Where do the lions go then? The communications manager has a response for that too. They go to zoos. To prove it to us, he agrees to show us the park's archives where records of the transfers are kept. How many lions, the average, are you giving to the zoo by year? Um, I would say about 20, 20 to 30. But many yeah. zoos in South Africa? No, all the... over the world. So last year, how many animals did you send to zoos? Um, I need to confirm. Just give me one second, sorry. How many lions did we send to the zoos last year? One. And the, the year before, do you know how many lions do you send to the zoo? No, you don't. There's not a big demand for zoos for lions. But we open, if there's any zoo in the world that, that wants lions and that they can prove that they look after them, we'll mo most likely um, sell a, a donate to them. The zoo's explanation doesn't seem to hold up. But the park has another option for housing the lions, selling them back to farmers, ones, they tell me, who have nothing to do with the hunting industry. We sent a batch of lions to Joanne Halley and also to um, Nazir Kaji. And both of them gave us affidavits to state that they do not support the Kent hunting industry. In this document, it says that a farmer, Nazir Kaji, bought 15 lions in 2013. We decide to call the farmer. We want to check that he has no links with the hunting industry. Yes, hello. Um, may I speak with Nazir Kaji, please? Speaking. Oh, hello. I'm looking for some lion hunts uh, somewhere, so can you... Yes, we do hunt. Just what kind of lion is it possible to hunt with you? Uh, no, we'll have to see. We'll have to see what's available. And you can send me also the prices and everything? Yes, you can just call me. Uh, you can send me an email. Yes. Any info you've got. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Bad luck for Lion Park. The first buyer that I call does in fact organize hunts himself. Is he an exception? We have a meeting with a park employee. He agrees to speak for the first time. According to him, selling animals to the hunting industry is common practice at Lion Park. He even states that he has witnessed some of the sales. For fear of reprisals, he prefers to testify anonymously. Why does this park need to sell the lions? This park is like every other petting zoo in, in the country. Uh, obviously, the, the lion's life of being petted is, is a very short space of time. I guess it's probably uh, four to five months. Yeah. So after that period, the lion is too big to be played with. So then you need more cubs coming in. And after four or five years, you've got 200 lions where you've got no use for most of them. What are you going to be doing with them? You're still going to be feeding them. The enclosures are very expensive to build, to look after them in terms of vet bills is expensive. The majority are going to be sold. And the only people who are going to pay for them are the hunters. There is no value for a live lion. How do they manage to move the animals from the lion park to the hunting industry? It could be the hunter himself coming to pick up the animals. Directly at the park? Directly at the park. Or it gets bought by just a dealer and possibly buying, say, ten lions, of which five could be going to somewhere legit and another five could be going to the hunting industry. If this statement is true, the lion cub this boy is petting at the park could well be the same animal as the one we see in this photo. The secret to success here is to ensure that neither the tourist nor the hunter know the truth. Lions caressed by tourists that end up being killed with a shotgun, sometimes after being drugged or mistreated. The government is aware of what's happening, but they have other priorities. The country is still getting back on its feet after apartheid and still faces big problems with unemployment and corruption. 
And so, in the face of a powerful industry where everything happens on private land, the authorities seem to have given up. As a government, um, we don't condone can hunting, but there are aspects of that hunting that we have prohibited. Um, unfortunately, the extent to which we can regulate that has always also been limited. And if it's something that relates to the ethics of hunting, that is something that we cannot regulate in any legislation because that's what's ethical for one person is not ethical for another person. It looks like you have laws. Uh, Maybe not enough, but you have laws. But what I've seen is that, in fact, you can, you can still uh, do anything you want, you know, uh, on the field, in these farms. I think, I think that, that is un unfortunately true. Uh, the reality, if you consider government's resources and funding, um, you know, financial resources and human resources, the only way to really deal with it is to um, make it compulsory for a conservation official to attend every single lion hunt, and we don't have the resources to do that. So unless we prohibit lion hunting, there will always be irregularities or illegalities taking place. Then we would have to close down the whole hunting industry. But if the government doesn't want to ban hunting, it is also because there may be a positive side. Paradoxically, it's apparently saved one of the most endangered species in Africa from extinction. The rhinoceros, a prime target for poachers. Their horns are attributed to have healing aphrodisiac qualities in Asia. And on the black market, rhino horn is more expensive than gold or cocaine. Wien van der Linde is one of the most important rhinoceros owners in the country. He authorizes four hunts per year on his land. Safaris that they charge rich Americans or Russians 90,000 euros to take part in. Why do you hunt some of them? If I don't get an income, I can't afford this whole conservation process. And I think I can't afford to look after them. We are commercial ranches. We're not biodiversity conservation like our parks. We've paid for those animals, we've paid for the land, we pay for the people. Sacrificing some animals in order to save others, Wien considers himself to be one of the last guardians of the rhinoceros. Most of them is coming from Kruger, the National Kruger Park, and then also from KwaZulu Natal, Kluzui National Park. We bought them there. So it means that National Park sent send you some rhino even if they know that you're going to hunt some of them? Yes, they do, because they've got a huge problem there. They're losing over a thousand a year by, by, by poaching. To protect his rhinos, Wien van der Linde does not skimp on security. Thanks to the income from hunting, he can pay for a private militia which costs him 400,000 euros a year. We are not allowed to show their faces because these heavily armed men risk their lives fighting poachers. This is syndicates and serious crime and, and serious people. So yeah, we have them to protect not just our, our rhinos, but also our people that's part of our staff. When we see the bullet jacket, the rifles, everything, it looks like a war. It is. It's nothing less than a war. All these people have been highly trained. They've been in the war in the Middle East as well. So they know what war is about, and we're serious about what we're doing. To protect the rhinoceroses, these men have the right to shoot poachers who enter their property. They patrol through the night, keeping watch for anything suspicious. 3,000 hectares are scrutinized. This time, there's nothing to report. Thanks to these men, no rhinoceros has ever been poached here. In the end, 
putting all these wild animals behind fences does have an advantage. Hunting, despite its excesses, enables the protection of several species. In any case, that is the firm belief of this wildlife expert. From 1964, when there was only half a million, today we've got uh, 22 million. Animals. So, uh, 22 million head of animals. Now, now that is an, a tremendous increase in a matter of uh, half a decade, 50, 50 years. But now, you know, there's more wildlife in South Africa now than there has been at any time in the past 200 years. So it's, it's a very unique situation and there's no other country in the world that have this record. It means that in this world, we're going to see fences everywhere. I mean, the nature that we think about and that we have in mind won't exist anymore, in fact. But if you're not going to fence areas and cordon them off as conservation areas, you can kiss a goodbye. You're gonna have to do that. I would have loved to see Africa rolling hills with herds of animals all over the place and, and nobody just kills them. It's only the predators. That will be my dream as well. But you must be pragmatic. It cannot happen. Forget it. Over the last 50 years, South Africa has become a gigantic theme park for tourists and hunters. But another country has gone even further and have been importing African wildlife. It's no longer the hunter who goes to Africa, but Africa that comes to the hunter. We are 14,000 kilometers from Pretoria in Texas. It is the place where there are most African animals outside of their continent of origin. It's South Africa's main competitor. 5,000 ranch owners breed antelopes, zebras, and noos here. I'm back with Cole Reed, the hunter who collects trophies. Hello. What's going on? Ten years ago, his family also started breeding exotic animals. On Cole's ranch, one can hunt 30 different African species. $15,000 for a kudu, $5,000 for a zebra. It's three times more expensive than in South Africa. Where do all these animals are coming from? Well, it, it's not, there isn't any more importation in the United States. It, that would be very difficult. Now, 50 years ago, there was. So that's, that's where these animals originated from. They came from, you know, Africa and Asia. In Texas, there's just so many people that have the herds. We don't. We don't need any outside forces anymore. We're breeding them here, so if we need an extra one, there's another ranch somewhere that's got some that they can sell to us. The ranch operates at a full capacity 300 days a year. They offer hunting just like in Africa, but without the constraints, a concept that appeals to a lot of Texan businessmen. You don't have to have a passport to come here. You don't have to have any long plane flights or layovers. Or It's close to home. It's safe. A lot of our clients uh, don't have to worry about warring tribes or uh, any diseases or snakes. or So I think a lot of that leads to people wanting to come here and experience that. Oh, it's an oryx. Yeah. 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 But how, how does this oryx manage to survive with that climate, you know, because it's cold now? It is cold, but, you know, it, it never really gets to freezing temperatures out here. I mean, it'll happen every once in a while, but it, they find a place to go and, and bed up and... Yeah. Many people saying that the future of uh, trophy hunting can happen in Texas. We're prepared for that. We, we were 15 years ago. This, this isn't about just hunting. It's about survival of the species. Yeah. So if they disappear in Africa, we, we may not be able to have all the species here, but we're gonna have uh, a lot. So definitely the future, the hunting is gonna be, you know, in a situation like we're in right now. Hunting farm-raised animals on fenced land will soon become the norm. After Texas and South Africa, Namibia and Zimbabwe are now also gearing towards this model. 
In order to exist today, wild animals must have a market value. Nature that is both wild and free is in the process of disappearing. <laughs>